It is a sad week here on Stuffed, and it is a sad week for the college basketball and overall basketball community as we mourn and grieve the loss of a friend and an icon in this profession. Longtime basketball scout Tom Kinchowski passed away on Monday after a long illness, and his presence will never again be replicated in this space. I knew Tom personally. We shared meals together, we shared laughs together, and I always knew that when I visited with Tom, I would leave that visit feeling better than I felt prior. Rest in peace, my friend. And before we start today's show, I would appreciate it if you could all just bow your heads and have a moment of silence for the departed, legendary figure that is the great Tom Kinchowski. Thank you. This is March. Chicken vodka wrap is to die for. Welcome to Stuff with John Rothstein. Best player you don't know in college basketball. We have a very high bar on this show. I want to let myself go be 400 pounds. I just want to make sure I don't go all in on chocolate chip pancakes at the diner down the street. <laughs> Forget about not sleeping until May. I may not sleep at all, but I wouldn't trade it for anything else. College hoops. Everything else is just secondary. Who's ready to nosh? Welcome to Stuffed with John Rothstein. Another action-packed show for you today as we are within five weeks of Selection Sunday for the 2021 NCAA Tournament. Not that everybody is counting or anybody's counting, but I have it down to the hour, down to the minute. Anyway, we are going to talk to one of the best players in college basketball in just a couple of minutes as we get set to chat with Seton Hall forward Sandrew Mamakilishvili. But first, a couple of big-picture storylines to hit in college hoops in a New York minute. I am going to start with this fact. I watch college basketball. I think about college basketball. I talk about college basketball seven days a week and twice on Sunday. And I do it from the moment I wake up in the morning to the moment I go to sleep. And after sampling everything that the sport has had to offer over the last couple of weeks, the one thing that's really been resonating with me is that Baylor and Gonzaga have officially separated themselves at a different level from the rest of the pack. There's always tears in college basketball, but it feels like the level of separation between the top two teams in the sport and the rest of the sport is significantly greater this season. Now, one of those teams that's in the second tier of teams behind Baylor and Gonzaga is Illinois. The Illini have played significantly better the last couple weeks, and the time and the window for Illinois basketball to cash in is right now. This is not a blue blood program that is regularly churning out 30 win seasons and deep runs in the NCAA tournament. Who knows the next time that Illinois will have a guard in his junior season, the caliber of Io DeSumo? Who knows when Illinois will again have a player at the post position like Kofi Coburn who can anchor the paint on both sides of the floor? If you're Illinois right now, Anything less than a trip to the second weekend of the NCAA tournament and being right there for a berth to the Final Four has to be considered a disappointment. And lastly, we have obviously spent a great deal of time and focus on this show, on different platforms, about the struggles that have faced the Blue Blood programs of the sport. Duke, Kentucky, Michigan State. It's time to stop talking about those programs. Unless one of these schools does something miraculous between now and Selection Sunday or makes a big run in its respective conference tournament, these are now non-stories in the sport. I'm going to stop talking about them unless there is a little bit more relevancy. Because right now, all three of these programs, very far away from competing in the 2021 NCAA tournament. Now, one player that's set to be on a team that's going to compete in the 2021 NCAA tournament is Seton Hall forward Sandro Mamakilishvili, and he joins us now here on Stuff with John Rothstein. And Sandro, before we get to basketball, I'm curious. You have one of the more unique last names that I have ever covered in all my years as a broadcast journalist. How often do people mispronounce Mamakilishvili? Uh, probably like 90% of the time. Uh, <laughs> I feel like they don't understand how easy it is sometimes. All you have to do is just, like, you can you say it however it's spelled, so I feel like people just mispronounce it because it's so long, but they're getting it down right now. 
Well, they're definitely going to get it down because you're obviously mild-mannered. We can tell with that response, and that reflects the way you play on the court so smooth. But my well-embedded moles tell me that in addition to thriving on the basketball court, Sandrew Mamakilishvili enjoys a good game of Uno on the road with the rest of the people in the Seton Hall program. How did that hobby start? Uh, it started by one of our managers uh, bringing the Uno cards. Um, uh, we were at Chicago. We were about to play DePaul, and mm -hmm. we had a one-day layover. So he was like, after the dinner, he was like, do you want to play Uno? And I feel like just everybody just said yes. And at the end, we was like 10 guys playing Uno. Uh, managers were there, and it was just an amazing uh, experience. So I feel like from there on, every time we're on the road, we just start playing Uno now. And uh, it's fun. It just passes time so quick, and we just enjoy being with each other. Well, and obviously, the more you play Uno with better Uno players, the better you're going to get at the game. And one could say that was part of the reason why you started out as such an effective player in college basketball, because prior to Seton Hall, you played at Montverde Academy with some of the best players in the country, guys like R.J. Barrett, Andrew Nemhard, Marcus Carr. What was it like to be on a team and be in a program with that type of talent? First of all, it was amazing, you know. Uh, Coach Boyle is definitely one of the best coaches in the country, and we definitely had one of the best players in uh, in the country as well. So I feel like it was a it was a challenge. It was kind of um, like I was in the comfort zone before going to Mount Verde, and it was kind of like taking me out of my comfort zone, challenging myself, and kind of seeing why I could improve and how could I get better. And I feel like Coach Ball just did an unbelievable job, just kind of helping me figure out what I want to do in the future and how I should kind of. Get, how I could get better. So um, every day in practice was a battle. You know, when you have R.J. Barrett, as you said, Andrew Nemhard, all of them players, uh, you can't just go and practice and not perform well. So it was an unbelievable experience just playing against them and just kind of getting better and getting to know the guys who are so highly ranked in our classes. So you're at Montverde. You're playing with some of the best players in the country. How did you get from being on one of the best teams in the country at Montverde to having an introduction to play at Seton Hall? Uh, you know, um, first of all, um, uh, when I came to States for the first time, I came to New Jersey. So I just got like a little familiar with this place. Uh, didn't know much about senior hall, but, uh, as you know, coach Boyle went to senior hall and, um, Grant, Meyer, Grant Bill Meyer did an amazing job just kind of recruiting me and, uh, getting me familiar with, uh, with senior hall university. So I feel like slowly I just fell in love with the, with the place and with the players, with the staff. So, um, I feel like at the end of the year, it was, it was one of my top choices. So uh, just, just knowing Coach Ball, uh, he talked really highly of Senior Hall, and just knowing how good of a coach uh, Kevin Willard is, uh, it was an easy decision at the end, definitely. Well, and obviously the decision has paid off. Seton Hall was one of the top teams in the country last year. You're in position again to make the NCAA tournament be a very tough out in the field. I'm curious, though, last season, everything aligned for Seton Hall to have a big run in the NCAA tournament. Obviously, the NCAA tournament never happened last year due to COVID-19. What was it like when you and your teammates found out that there wasn't going to be an NCAA tournament? Uh, it's a rough day to go back, definitely. It was, it was really sad. Um, we were getting ready to play our first game at the Big East tournament, and out of nowhere, we just got text, um, pack your stuffs, we have to leave. And I feel like at first, you know, I feel like it was so shocking that everybody's like kind of like, do we really have to go? Like, are they playing with us? What's going on? And I feel like once we were on the bus and we just saw coaches' faces and just kind of we realized like, oh, everything is over. At the same time, we did realize that, you know, Corona is a really big deal. So it was a smart decision. But, you know, um, we, pl we we practiced and played so hard for that moment. It just it was a really big disappointment. And, you know, um, it just it, it definitely sucked to be in this in, the, in that position. Now, it was a disappointment, obviously, that you couldn't play in the NCAA tournament last year. But it was a blessing that you got to spend part of your career playing with the guy like Miles Powell. What are the biggest things that you took from Miles Powell just being around somebody like that each and every day? You know, there is not one thing you could take uh, from Miles Powell. There are many things you could uh, took from Miles Powell. And definitely the first thing I would say is his passion for the game. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, even if the game was not going how he wanted to, you know, you knew that he would come out and just put 100% on the court. And his emotions were so raw. Like, 
every time you would see him play, you would see how uh, full of emotions his game was. So definitely the first thing I learned from him was just how to play with my emotions and, you know, uh, how to play hard. Uh, he was a great leader as well. I always knew how to talk to you on and off the court, which I learned. And I'm trying to kind of put, put that in my uh, game, just being a leader. I want to be example for the young guys uh, and definitely how to have a confidence. You know, he was he was an unbelievable yeah. player with with so, such a confident player. So I definitely learned how to just kind of take that confidence and put it in my game, even though if something is not going my way, just stay confident, just ball out. Well, Miles obviously has moved on from Seton Hall, and you have now taken over the focal point of the program as being the primary threat on each and every possession for Seton Hall. What have been the biggest keys in your development to becoming the player that you are this year versus last year? Uh, you know, uh, I feel like it was it was a smooth transition. Uh, first of all, like last year, uh, as you know, I got injured and I kind of missed two months of uh, of the uh, of the season. Uh, but I feel like just just hard work, you know. Um, as you know, as the people know, I went uh, off campus during the summer. Uh, I went to Pennsylvania and I just worked out there every day. Uh, worked on everything, uh, dribbling, shooting, uh, just getting my mind right, and just knowing. As soon as I decided to. Uh, take my name out from the draft I knew I was coming into the senior hall a uh, really talented team uh, and I know they needed me to be a leader so I feel like just putting my mind to that task that to being a leader and being one of the best players in college basketball really helped me to just kind of come here and just kind of show everybody how I developed. When you have developed into one of the best players in the country and you know I noticed that you got some high praise Last week from UConn coach Dan Hurley, he compared you to yeah. Troy Murphy, who obviously played in the NBA for a long time and had a great career at Notre Dame. But for you personally, if Sandrew Mamakilashvili could compare himself to one player, past or present, who would it be? Uh, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, one of the players I really look up to is a Sabonis. Um, he's an amazing player, having a great NBA career. Uh, definitely, uh, I love Lamar Odom, how he played. He was a lefty as well. Um, yeah. And my favorite player, Tony Kukoc. So I was trying to kind of mirror their yeah. game and kind of study study their film. So, uh, you know, I'm trying to get everything from a little bit of everybody and just kind of interpreting my game. Well, and obviously to flourish the way you flourished in basketball, you have to be coached by a pretty good coach. What are the biggest things, though, about Kevin Willard that not a lot of people know about, but he shows you each and every day? Uh, de definitely uh, hard work and dedication. Um, I, I don't remember the last practice he missed or the last time he didn't have an answer to my question. Uh, definitely a guy you can trust. And the, the best part about Coach Willard is every time I have a bad game, I can call him straight after the game or I can come in early in the office. He comes every day at 6 a.m. and I, we can have a full heart-to-heart -heart conversation and he kind of gives you a pat in the back and tells you, like, everything's going to be okay. Just keep playing your game. I believe in you. And I feel like like for a player, just having a, a, a coach who trusts you like that and gives you that much of a confidence, uh, it just – it just makes your makes your things easy on the court, and when I go out there, I just know every time I look back at my shoulder, I can have a guy who has my back. So definitely a guy who comes in every day and gives you his best, and that's why we out, go out there and give him uh, our best every day. Well, and obviously you've had a lot of talks recently because you had two big wins last week. Prior to that, though, you guys lost a very tough game on the road at Villanova, and then you came back home to Newark and lost home games back to back to Creighton and Villanova. What was the dialogue like within your locker room after those losses at home? You know, um, first Villanova and, uh, and, and Creighton, like all, all three games we really played hard. And, yeah. you know, it, it just didn't go our way. First of all, the, 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 the main aspect of our talks were how to kind of handle uh, other teams' uh, runs. You know, Creighton had a great run at the... Uh, in the second half at the end of the game um, and how to kind of defend better. Uh, we knew we had uh, major errors defensively and we had to really lock in and kind of play better defense. So I feel like the main aspect of our talks were how to be a better defending team and a better rebounding team. Uh, and I feel like from there on, watch film. And we watched a lot of film after those games 
and kind of saw what we did wrong. So going into the next week with Providence and UConn, we just knew from the jump we had to lock in. We had to play better defense and bring more intensity to the game. And we knew with UConn we had to out-rebound them or box them out every time because they're such a great rebounding team. So definitely we kind of scouted the teams great, and um, we knew we need, we had our bank against the wall, and we came out and fought. Yeah, no, you answered the bell with two big wins. So, okay, so aside from being obviously at a different level defensively, what are the biggest keys for Seton Hall between now and Selection Sunday to continue to be a better team and a team that nobody wants to play during the NCAA tournament? Uh, first and foremost, definitely we have uh, older guys on the team. I feel like we all had to come together and kind of realize that we only have a few games left and we just got to keep fighting. And whatever happens, we can't control. only thing we can control is every day, uh, what we do every day on the court and how we come out and what mindset we're going to have. So I feel like we just got to understand that team wins the game and not individuals. So I feel like as as long as we come out there and just play together, uh, we know everything going to take care of itself. So I feel like the main aspect is to stay together, stay hungry, and just try to make it to the March Madness as far as we can. Well, you mentioned an interesting term there. You said stay hungry. And from the people that I talk to in Seton Hall's program, they tell me that if Sandra Mamakulashvili is hungry, he wants to go to one place, and that's Chama Mama in the city. <laughs> if you had to get something at Chama Mama, what would be on the menu? To be honest, I'm a, I love eating Chama Mama. I, I just can't <laughs> go there and order the whole menu. Um, <laughs> but definitely one thing I would, uh, I would order is Khachapuri. It's a, it's a cheese bread, uh, amazing cheese bread. Uh, and I would also probably eat um, Padrijani. That's like uh, eggplant. Uh, okay. That's my favorite meal out there. So definitely those two are go-tos. And then everything else is going to come by itself. They know what I love. And I feel like every time I go there, they just uh, I just come home with a lot of bags of food. So I just love the place. All right, well, final thing, Sandro. You obviously gave a nice plug there to Chama Mama, but food is obviously a big part of this show. It's a big part of my life. Aside from Chama Mama, if Sandro Mama really could have one meal, one place, where would it be and what would it be? Whew, uh, that's a tough question right there. Um, I think I'm, I lived in Italy, so, you know, I'm really used to Italian food besides Georgian food, so... I would definitely go with uh, spaghetti al carbonara. Uh, that's that's my favorite favorite uh, type of spaghetti. So definitely, I would just go to some great Italian place, hopefully in the city, and just kind of order that, and uh, and that would be my meal. Now I got to ask you this: I was supposed to go to Italy last summer for my honeymoon. Obviously, I couldn't go because of COVID. Is the Italian food in Italy that much better than the Italian food in New York? Oh my God! I can't wait till you go because, like, it's unbelievable out there. I feel like everything tastes better. Uh, and I'm not saying that it's bad in, in out here, but Italians just have that little extra flavor to it, and and it, it just you know it just hits differently. So I feel like once you go there and you try whatever you whatever you like, you're just gonna be like, yeah, this is it. I would like to come here and stay here and live here for the rest of my life. So you're gonna love it. I'm telling you. All right, well, you know, obviously, I'm active on social media, so DMs with restaurant recommendations are always accepted. Sandra Mamakilashvili, one of the best players in college basketball, continuing to thrive for a Seton Hall team that is on an upward trajectory heading into the NCAA tournament in 2021. Thanks for joining us here today on Stuffed. Thank you very much for your invite, and I hope you and your family stay healthy and safe. Uh, God bless, and thank you again. All right, stay positive, test negative. That's Seton Hall forward Sandrew Mamakilishvili. We are now into our next segment of Stuffed with John Rothstein, which we call Schmooze. I'm again trying to keep things light after the Super Bowl party. Somewhat Super Bowl party. It was me, my fiance, and two stuffed animals that I had on Sunday. Nice healthy salad again. Cafe Luca, 71st and 1st. Nothing but the best. Little salmon, little avocado. It's clean. It's healthy. It makes you feel like you don't got to go and obviously get a bigger belt. Oh, that's good stuff. So, here's the thing. I want to remind everybody. My fiance's birthday is this week. It's on Thursday. It's February 11th, and obviously, I always get sandwiched 
between her birthday and Valentine's Day being on Sunday. But, you know, we're in the middle of a global pandemic. What can you do? You can't go out to restaurants, and I wouldn't go out to restaurants because I don't want to put myself in harm's way while we are still obviously right in the middle of a college basketball season. So what do you do? There's only so many things that you can get on Seamless to make things feel extra special. I'm thinking about different things. I'm racking my brain. But right now I'm pushing a boulder up a hill because it's the middle of college basketball season. You're trying to make somebody's birthday special. You're trying to make Valentine's Day special. But you're also in a situation where you know that UCLA has to find a way to beat Washington State and Washington this week if they're going to stay on pace to make the NCAA tournament. So in addition to sending me your questions on college hoops, if you can send me a couple of thoughts on ways, obviously, to make a birthday for somebody and a Valentine's Day for somebody special, I will be taking all requests right after this bite. That's good stuff. That's good stuff. Now let's go to our next segment called Don't At Me, Bro. Send me your questions on Twitter. I'm at John Rothstein. That's John. J-O-N. John is from Sean Bean. Should conference tournament perform or should conference performance be given more weight in determining 68 field due to offseason restrictions, lack of exhibition games, last-minute opponent changes? No, I like the way things are right now with the overall body of work because if you're putting all that focus on conference play, it minimizes the importance of the games played in November and December. Next question. This is from Ryan Basnicki, and it's John. What needs to happen for the Spartans? He's talking about Michigan State to go dancing in March. Got to win games. Got to win a lot of games. But Michigan is obviously expected to have a lot of quality of Big Ten opponents starting with tonight against Penn State. Michigan State's got to go on a run leading up to the Big Ten tournament because right now they are nowhere near the field of 68. Next question. Parker Braun Fan Club wants to know, John, what are your thoughts on Missouri? The computer numbers don't think highly of them, but the eye test wins do. Which side do you fall on? Missouri, to me, is a team that is built to play deep into the NCAA tournament because they can operate in different styles. They can play fast. They can play slow. And they are incredibly old. They are incredibly old. They play 10 guys in Saturday's win against Alabama, nine of them were in at least their third year of college basketball. I think experience matters a little bit. Next question. This is from Curtis Shoda, and it's John. Could you see Indiana winning a game or two in the big big dance? Absolutely. I think teams that are in the Big Ten in the middle of the pack are going to have an excellent chance to push out once they get into the bracket because and I mean this affectionately, the Big Ten is the best conference in college basketball. So if depending on the matchup, you might see more Big Ten teams advance in a tournament in the first two rounds. Still not sure, though, if a Big Ten team this year can win a national championship. If there was one, I would lean towards Illinois. I would also probably put Michigan and Ohio State in that, but I haven't seen Michigan in a couple weeks. Next question comes from Rob Mazzola. That's John. Any team outside of Gonzaga Baylor can make a push to a title. This goes back to the tier situation. We have Gonzaga and Baylor above everybody else. After that, there's Michigan, there's Illinois, there's Ohio State, there's Alabama, there's Florida State, there's Houston if they can get their mojo back. But you see those teams jumble together. You don't see them separate, obviously, like Gonzaga and Baylor have so far. This is from A.W. Ross. What will it take for the Badgers to find their way back to early season form before March? And this might sound like a cop-out answer, but shot-making. When Wisconsin went on a run last year to win the Big Ten regular season title... It was because they shot the ball from deep at an exceptionally high level. That's what it's going to take for the Badgers to, again, put themselves in the same position. They are not a team right now that has been wowing anybody offensively. Next question. 
This is from FCC Offense. How deep of a run can Rutgers make in March? I will know more about the best way to answer that question after I see the Scarlet Knights against Iowa this week because Rutgers, since Steve Beichel changed the lineup, making Paul Mulcahy a starter, making Caleb McConnell a starter, Rutgers has been a different team. Their bench has gotten better. Their balance has gotten better. Rutgers, to me, has a chance to be a second weekend team if the matchup obviously benefits them. And you wouldn't have said that, you know, a couple of weeks ago. Time now to wrap up with some news and nuggets around the world of college basketball. One thing I've been thinking about. In the early rounds of the NCAA tournament, sometimes even the Sweet 16 and the Elite Eight, we have seen higher seeded teams get the benefit of playing at a geographic advantage because a lot of these games are played close to their campuses. Duke has played in Greensboro. Villanova has played in Brooklyn or in Pittsburgh or in Philadelphia. You won't have that this year because all the games are going to be in Indianapolis. So what does that mean? The playing field for first round upsets how will never be more level than it is this season. That's something to take in consideration. Another thing to keep an eye on is the surge at St. John's. The Red Storm have won six straight games entering tonight's game at Butler. Mike Anderson looking like now the Big East coach of the year, potentially. St. John's on an upward trajectory, a team that, again, has played its way into the NCAA tournament discussion. This is a mid-major nugget. Belmont is 20-1 this season. Belmont's top offensive player from last year, Adam Kunkel, transferred in the middle of the summer, in July, and then went to Xavier as a transfer. And Belmont has still gotten a 20-1. and one. I talked to their coach, Casey Alexander, this week about how Belmont has been so dominant. And there's a number of different reasons, but one thing especially is that Luke Smith, a Division Three All-American, has stepped in and replaced Kunkel, who left for Xavier. This is something you're going to see more and more in college basketball if immediate eligibility is a thing that, as expected, is offered to players. Belmont loses a guy who transfers to the Big East. They take a kid from Division Three, plug the hole. Nothing else happens after that. I think it's going to be a common occurrence, and it goes to show you the unintended consequences that could be happening when immediate eligibility is obviously something that is offered to players. Some games to watch tonight. Alabama against South Carolina. Alabama's lost two of three. A big one in the Big 12 between West Virginia and Texas Tech. St. John's against Butler, and then on CBS Sports Network, I'll be in studio for this, Creighton against Georgetown. Georgetown won at Creighton last week, was very competitive against Villanova at the Finn on Sunday. Kudus Wahab playing at a really high level right now for the Hoyas. We'd like to thank Seton Hall forward Sandrew Mamakilishvili for joining us here on Stuff with John Rothstein. Remember, stay positive, test negative, and in the airport of life, college basketball is the Delta Sky Club.